please worship in your giving. And uh, as, as mentioned on the screen, you know, next weekend we've got a very special weekend. I just want to reiterate that, that uh, Dr. Hilton and Teresa will be here and uh, we'll be doing an ordination service in the evening, which is open to the public. Please come celebrate with that with a very special couple that's part of our church family. But also come next week expecting to hear a fresh word as part of our oversight comes in and speaks. These are people that pray for us every day. Uh, these are people that get our financial reports. These are people that speak into our lives. Uh, these are people that seek God for us and are there to help us walk in what God's called us to do. And so it's an honor for them to take time out of their schedule to come up and to be with us. And these are people that travel all over uh, ministering and have opportunities all the time. And we're just blessed to have them in our life and we're able to serve together. And you know, there's so many different ways to get involved in open arms, and as you're giving and as you're worshiping, I want you to think about, what am I doing? How am I serving in open arms? What are some areas that I can get involved in in ministry? I, and we do our part together. There's so much we will accomplish. So uh, let's stand to our feet and prepare to worship the Lord. Father, we come to worship you right now. We're honored to celebrate you. We thank you that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, and that Jesus, that we can worship you today in spirit and in truth. I pray that, God, as we worship, that you would inhabit the praises of your people and that you would minister in our midst, that you would meet every need, that you would, uh, Lord, encourage each one, that there would be words spoken in season, that whatever's needed in this house. I'm lifting up your name. There's freedom in the atmosphere. And oh, I feel like dancing. I feel like praising you. Because I know. Breakthrough, I'm gonna see you move. This is my breakthrough. Amen. This is my breakthrough. I'm gonna break through. Yeah. And this is where your word takes hold of me. This is where my fear lets go. Your spirit is alive inside of me And I'm ready, yes I'm ready To cross over the line, leave it all behind Nothing's gonna keep me here Oh, until I see a change I'm lifting up your name There's freedom in the atmosphere And oh, I feel like dancing I feel like praising you Cause I know This is my breakthrough I'm gonna see you move This is my breakthrough If you're needed today, just reach out to Him This is my breakthrough Amen I'm gonna break through I'll keep on dancing I want to read something from Romans 8. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do, and he sent his only son in a body like that, uh, bodies we sinners have, and in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Because of his blood, right? We belong to him. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that today. So we're thankful for his blood. And we have power over sin because of that. Oh, you call me out of darkness. You silence every lie. And no other voice will define me. As I belong to you. I belong to you. Oh, you called us out of darkness. You call me out of darkness. You silence every lie. And no other voice will define me. Because I belong to you. Because I belong to you. Let's declare it today. You know the enemy. What I have, change 
God. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. of God. Uh, do me a favor before you sit down. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor one thing where God's been good to you. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and just say, hey, God's been good to me in this. Amen? And then you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I will declare the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. There was a... Uh, <clears throat> There was a story back many years ago, uh, National Geographic uh, shared this story, and I've heard it shared over the years, and I heard it shared again recently, and it made me think about our our sermon series, uh, The Best Year Yet, 2020, and change your thinking, and you'll change your life. And, uh, you know, some of our thinking is, a lot of of our problem comes from our thinking. And so this story that aired years ago, and as people have talked about over the years, there was a lady that had a bow constrictor as a pet. And uh, let's just, yeah, so why you would have a bow constrictor as a pet, I have no idea why you would do that. But this lady had one, and she noticed that it was not eating. For weeks, it was not eating. And so she was concerned about her pet bow constrictor, so she took the pet to the vet. I didn't even know a vet would see a bow constrictor, but evidently this vet did. And said, you know, I'm really concerned. Uh, My baby here is not eating, hadn't eaten for a couple weeks. And so the vet said, "Really? Well, uh, tell me about it. Uh, where do where do you where do you keep this bow constrictor? Well, it's in my bedroom. It's got its you know place in my bedroom, and it's you know its cage or whatever its uh, thing." And uh, he said, "She said, well, do you?" The vet said, "Well, do you ever get it out and play with it? Oh, I play with it all the time. Sweetest thing as can be. Love playing with it, and get it out. And sometimes it even sleeps with me. Really? Yeah. And." Uh, Said, well, uh, recently it was sleeping, and so she said, well, when it sleeps, the, the, the vet said, well, when it sleeps, does it, is it curled up, or is it laying alongside you? And so, you know, that's funny you said that. Just the other day, uh, I woke up, and, and the bow constrictor was laying just right, right up against me, stretched out, and I thought that was the sweetest thing. I thought it just wanted to snuggle with me. And uh, the vet said, well, ma'am, I've got, I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news. The good news is there's nothing wrong with your bow constrictor, <laughs> The bad news is uh, she is starving herself and preparing to stretch herself so that she can eat you. Now, first of all, who has a bow constrictor as a pet? Anyway, God help them, right? But that's what we do 
with some of our thinking. I've had people tell me, I'm strong enough, this won't affect me. I'm strong enough, I got this. It's just a thought. I'm just looking, I'm not touching. I'm just, you know, I just, it just ran through my mind. It's not, not going to do anything, and, and, and it's such a lie. We often snuggle with sin because, loved one, we let a thought come in, and instead of making it captive and making it obedient to Christ, we think on that thought. Or we do nothing with the thought, which means even though we may not be thinking 100% on that thought, it's still in our mind. In other words, we don't take authority over that thought. We let it lay next to us and size us up. And what Satan is doing is preparing to, he's already deceived us thinking that's okay. But he's preparing to steal, kill, and destroy us if we don't recognize that you don't get in bed with a snake. Come on, somebody. Amen. You know, we review of last week a little bit, uh, people got all these New Year's resolutions, and they're great, and that's fine, and you know, 60-some uh, percent of, of Americans make New Year's resolutions, 6 to 8 percent keep them, so we're not very good at doing what we say we're going to do, but I challenge you to make a life resolution, and not to list just a bunch of do goals, but who goes, who, who am I, who do I want to be, how do I want to be remembered when I leave this earth? How do I want to be remembered at the end of this year looking back? See, if we can recognize who we are in Christ and become who God's called us to be, then we'll be able to lay those do goals out and we'll be able to accomplish even greater things for the kingdom of God and personally greater things in our life. We talked about last week, again, just quick review. Develop a warrior mentality. If you want to change your life, you've got to change your thinking. What you think of the most is going to be the direction your life goes in. You are a product, you and I are a product of how we think. We have become what we thought back in the past. We will become in the future what we're focusing on now. And so change your thinking, change your mind, develop a warrior mentality. We talked about strongholds. A stronghold is an argument that you believe which contradicts the person and the power of Christ. It's giving the devil a secure place to work in your life or in my life. And so the Bible says to demolish the strongholds, to crush them. We also learned that we need to identify the stronghold. What is the one thing? There's more than one thing, I'm sure, but what's the, what's the dominant thing? What's the one thing that's holding you back from doing what God's called you to do? It's usually a mindset. It's a stronghold in the mind. The devil says you can't, so you believe it. People told you all your life you couldn't, so you don't. But God says you can do anything through him. And so we've got to change our mindset. Identify the stronghold, and then identify, we learned last week, the spiritual truth that will demolish that stronghold. In other words, it needs to replace that stronghold so we can step out and do what God's called us to do. I encourage you to go back and listen to the message last week if you weren't here, because that's just a really quick overview of what's going on. But what I hear people say all the time is this. I hear people say, I can't help but think about what I think about. My thoughts just come in my mind. I, I wake up and I'm depressed. I wake up and this is on my mind. There are many people that are born again, born again believers that are going to heaven. But their mind is full of stinking thinking. Because we've got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and that's a lifelong process. So I can be saved and born again but still got a mind full of junk. And God wants to work through that junk and that garbage and get that out of our mind so that we can become everything he created us to be, so we can become who he created us to be, and then we can do what he created us to do. There are some people that are full of anger, full of bitterness, full of resentment, full of unforgiveness because we've not fought the battle in the mind and overcame it through Christ. Again, like I said last week, your life is always moving in the strongest direction of your thoughts. The invisible war that's taking place is the battle of the mind. Uh, Your greatest asset is your mind, but it's also the greatest battleground. Victories are are won or lost in the mind. Before you know, that's where it takes place. Everything that you ever do comes here. And I'm going to lay down some foundational truths uh, before we get into what we can do. And then I'm going to give you. I've got three on the schedule to give you, but I'm probably only going to have time to give you two today. And so that's probably the plan of what's going to happen. But I'm going to lay down some financial foundational truth first. How do you make your mind mind? That's a tough one. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Paul had that problem, the Apostle Paul. I'm always thankful when someone of the elite status of who I respect highly, like the Apostle Paul, I'm always thankful when they have problems that I've had or have. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? 
it may, gives me hope that I can overcome because Paul did overcome. And we're going to look at that scripture in a minute. But he said in Romans 7, 20 through 23, I read last week, but if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing it. It is sin living in me that does it. I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin and is still within me. And so there's a battle that's going on. What's interesting is to watch Paul grow in his faith. And he writes 2 Corinthians. We're going to read that. And then later in his life, when he's in prison, he writes the book of Philippians. And he's always talking about this battle in the mind. In 2 Corinthians 10, I'm going to read these two scriptures to you. These are our texts for today. Three through six, really this is our text for the whole series. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down, to demolish the strongholds of human reasoning, and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And after you've become fully obedient, we will punish everyone who remains disobedient. And then Philippians 4, 6 through 8 says, don't worry about anything. But instead, pray about everything. That's, that's the greatest advice right there. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. Isn't that what we need, peace? Which exceeds anything that we can understand, the peace that passes understanding. His peace will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, he says, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Change your thinking. Change your life. Fix your thoughts on what? Well, we can think on negative. I mean, no, you can wake up and say it's a bad day. You can wake up and focus on the negative. Or we can fix our thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. Think about these things. Meditate on these things, one translation says, that are excellent and worthy of praise. How do we demolish strongholds? We take captive every thought and make it line up with the truth of God's word. What does God say? Because who has the final say? God does. He has the final say overall, and eventually will have the final say in your life. But if we'll give him the final say now, we'll live life a whole lot better. Change our thinking, and we'll change our life. Well, let me lay down some foundational things. First of all, number one, don't believe everything you think. Just because you think something's true doesn't mean it is. You know how we talk a lot about mental illness? And you know how that's become a, an issue that people are talking about more? I'm just going to break it down, and I'm just going to take care of the whole thing right now. Every one of us are mentally ill. You say, oh, pastor, that's not very encouraging. I didn't say that's the end. But because of sin, we have a depraved mindset. Because of sin, our fallen nature, our mind was far from God. Now, because of the blood of Jesus, our mind can be renewed, we can be restored, and we can be healed from mental illness. But the reality is every human being in this world comes into this world and has a mental illness because of the fall of mankind. We have things in our mind that if we don't come to Christ and, and renew our mind and give our heart to Christ and become born again, that our mind will go in all different directions. Even as a born again believer, we still have to renew our mind. And so what I want to encourage us today is don't believe everything you think. Because everything you think is true is not true. How many believe something was true and believed it was true and you argued it was true and you thought it was true and then you found out it wasn't true? Oh man, and then you got to go, oh, I was wrong. Or you act like you didn't know. What do you mean I said that, right? I mean, we, you, know how, you know how we do. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We have the ability to lie to ourselves. We have the ability to tell ourselves that things are not as bad as they really are, that they're better than what they are, or that we're okay, and that everything's fine. Anything, anytime we sin, loved ones, we deceive ourselves. We think that we know better than what God does. The quicker we understand, we have blind spots. I don't care who you are. You have blind spots. There's areas where the enemy's coming at you and trying to deceive you. And that's why we need the body of Christ as well, because we need people that love us enough to speak the truth into us and say, hey, don't do that. Well, what do you mean? Nothing's wrong. I'm fine. I can handle this. I'm just 
looking or I'm just thinking for a moment. It's not going to control me. No, no, you're wrong. You're already deceived. It's already got you. See, we need people that will help us identify our blind spots. We're biased in what we believe. It's interesting when you study the brain and the optic nerve uh, that when we're looking at something, there are more impulses. This, This is interesting to me. There are more impulses from our brain coming forward than from our eyes going backwards. In other words, the brain is telling us what we see. That's like backwards. You get that? If I see something, then I ought to be able to tell my brain this is what I see. But because of our bias, listen, when we look at something, that's why you can have four people look at the same thing and give four different uh, answers of what really happened or what's going on because our brain tells us what we see instead of our eyes really telling our brain what we see. And so we've got to do what? We've got to change our thinking, and then we'll change the way we see things. It'll change our mindset. The second thing is this. Guard your minds from garbage. How many remember the old saying, garbage in, garbage out? Right? Proverbs 15, 14 says, a wise person is hungry for knowledge, while a fool feeds on trash. Now, you can study all these health experts or these exercise gurus, and they'll tell you there's three kinds of food. There's brain food, junk food, and toxic food. The same is true spiritually. What we put in is going to come out. So if we keep putting something in, it's going to come out. Psalm 101.3 says, I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. I hate all who deal crookedly. I will have nothing to do with them. We think that we can allow things in our mind and they won't affect us. I've been convicted of this recently. I mean, you can't, you can hardly watch anything anymore that doesn't have something bad in it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And especially if you like adventure and if you like mystery and if you like uh, criminal investigation shows, you can hardly watch anything that doesn't have something in it. And so I begin, as the Lord's dealing with me on this, to think about what am I putting in my mind? And there's a wrestling mask going there. Is this really affecting me? I mean, I want to figure this mystery out, but is the process to get to that affecting the way I think? How is this affecting me as, as a believer, as a man of God? How is this getting in my ma- mind? So we've got to be guard against what comes in. What, what's the thing that is dominant in my mind? What do I allow in my mind more than anything? If I spend more time in the presence of God, praise and worship, then how many know God's going to speak and the word of God and the, and the praise of God and, the, and, and everything that God wants to do is going to flow through me? Remember last week I talked about we either have a kingdom mindset or a worldly mindset. What's our focus? The next thing is another foundational truth is make time to think and learn. Proverbs 18, 15 said, intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. A lifelong learner. Do we, th- do we ever make time to think? You know, we, it's been proven, and you can get into all kinds of statistics that will back this up, but we've become an electronic age that we don't often think about anything. We let everything else think for us. Even our political views. If you're on one side, you watch CNN. If you're on another side, you watch Fox. And even now, you can't even watch CNN or Fox because they don't even make sense to what they said they made sense before. Come on, somebody, amen? I don't know if you realize, we're getting news reported to us that really isn't the news anymore. And then you get all kinds of stuff on the internet, and so we let other people tell us how to think. And we don't think for ourselves. And when I say think for ourselves, I'm talking about a person that is a believer that takes captive every thought and makes it obedient to Christ, fix our thoughts on the Lord so that we can have discernment to think what God is saying and know what God is saying and know what really is going on. When's the last time you stopped and put everything aside and said, you know what, I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes just thinking? We don't do that very often. We used to use our minds a whole lot more. We used to memorize phone numbers. I still know phone numbers from my childhood. There's people out here, I don't know your phone number because I got your name and I can just put boom and I got you. The only numbers I know now are my family. I got all those memorized just in case I need them. But other than that, I don't have anybody's numbers really memorized. You understand what I'm saying? We don't, we don't use our mind. We don't train our mind. And loved ones, when it comes to spiritual truths, we need to take time and think. And we need to think with God. And we need to dream with God. And I'm going to get into that in a couple weeks. There are many people that will never see their dream come to pass because they quit dreaming. They can't, they quit. You know, the Bible says that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we hope, think, or imagine. You know, kids have an imagination, but electronics has taken away some of that imagination. I'm not against electronics. I use them all the time. There's good things for them, but understand what I'm saying. We need time to think. You got to make time to think. You got to make time to dream. We got to make time to say, what, 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 God, what do you want to do? Just imagine and begin to write, wow, God, you, you know, and just begin to dream and imagine. 
Why? Because God can do that and he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that and more. We'll get into that in the weeks ahead. The next foundational truth is this. Now, let me ask you this question before we go on, because we're coming to this in a couple weeks. What would you attempt for God if you knew you could not fail? I got to tell you, you see that picture there? That's me in 2020. I've said I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I haven't done it, and I've given all the reasons why it would fail and why I can't do it, and I'm pushing myself, and I'm just going to make myself jump and hope I get to the other side. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Why? Because if I don't ever make the attempt, I'm never going to get there, and neither are you. What would you attempt for God if you knew you couldn't fail? All right, another foundational truth. Your thoughts control your life, but you control your thoughts. Your thoughts control your life, but who controls the thoughts? You do. I do, right? Proverbs 23, 7 says, the man thinketh, so is he. You can choose what you think about. We need to exercise that choice more often. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times we let everybody else think for us. Have you ever been concerned about, uh, you know, we live in a world, people are concerned about global warming, people are concerned about pollution of all different times, uh, of all different kinds. Have you ever been concerned about mind pollution? Where do I spend my focus? What do I think on? What, what, what's, what's predominant, you know, what's the dominant thought in my mind that goes over and over again? Because where, where, that's where my life is going to lead. And so here's what I want you to ask the next time you have a thought is, do I really... Do I really want to think about this right now? Do I really need to think about this right now? Next time you're worried, say, do I really want to worry about this? First of all, worry is wrong, right? Sin. But ask you, do I really want to worry about this? Or fear comes in. Do I really want to have fear right now? Or do I want to put my faith in God? See, what I'm saying is we got to take control of our thought life. Your thoughts control your life, but you control your thoughts. And so what we think is not somebody else's fault. We blame it on everything else, but the reality is we got to take ownership right here. Any change, next foundational truth, any change that I want to make in my life must start with my mind. Last week I talked about changing your mindset. In two weeks we're going to get into Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world. We're going to talk about living your mission, actually three weeks, uh, how to live that mission out. you got to change your mindset. We talked a little bit about that, but we'll get into how do you change your mindset. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of that today, but we'll get in deeper uh, coming up. We need to check up from the neck up. Because what happens up here determines what happens with the rest of you. Another foundational truth is, I can change how I feel by changing how I think. How many want to feel better? How many like to feel better? Have you ever told yourself to feel better? Have you ever told your feelings, don't be sad, be happy? How's that working for you? Not well. What do we got to do? We got to change our thinking. We got to change our mindset, right? We got to change our mindset, what we allow to flow through our brain, what we allow to, what we, what we dwell on, what we think about. And so what we, you know, you may have bitter thoughts, you know, or you may have, you may be bitter. Well, if you have bitter, you got bitter thoughts. You may be depressed. Well, if you're depressed, you got depressing thoughts. Uh, you know, you may be sad. Well, if you're sad, you got sad thoughts. So what do we do? Well, Psalm 42, 6 says, here in exile, my heart is breaking, so I turn my thoughts to him, to God. Let me tell you what will change your thinking. Turn your thoughts to God. I've been depressed and said, I don't want to be depressed. I want to be happy. It didn't work. I'm still depressed. But you know what I did? I turned my thoughts to God and began to worship God. And all of a sudden, I'm not depressed anymore. All of a sudden, something changed. What changed? I fixed my thoughts on him. I changed my thinking, so I changed what? My life. You can do the same thing. God's given you the ability to do that. He's given you the natural ability to do that, but with the Spirit of God, we'll get into that later, he's given you the supernatural ability to do it as well. How many watch TV and you don't like what's on TV? What do you do if you don't like what's on TV? What do you do? Change the channel. Some of us need to change it or turn it off. Yes. Was that Wendy that said that? She always tells me, turn it off. Change the channel. Turn it off. Why? You don't have to listen to it. Same thing in your mind. Change the channel. I'm not going to think on this. This isn't what God says. No, I'm going to think on what God says. Jonah said, I love this, Jonah 2.7, coming from his perspective, I get it, you're in a bad place. Jonah 2.7, when I lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once more to God. <laughs> you ever been in a, you're in the belly of a fish, you go turn your thoughts to God too, right? Whatever things go, what do you go? You know what? I'm turning my thoughts back to God because this isn't working. 
My thoughts got me here, and my thoughts are certainly not going to get me out of here. So I'm going to turn my thoughts to God. I'm going to think once more of Him. The way you think, listen, this is key. The way you and I think determines the way we feel, and the way we feel determines the way we act. Change your thinking, change your life. Next foundational truth. Every behavior is based on a belief. Every time you do something good or bad, it's because there's a belief beneath it. Haggai 1.5 says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways or consider your thoughts. Have you ever been in an argument with your wife, your spouse, your husband, whatever you're married, husband, wife? Anybody ever been, nobody here, some of you, I know you have because you told me. How many of you have ever been in, a, in, a, in an argument with your spouse and you're having a very civilized adult discussion? And then something is said, bam, you snap, and all of a sudden you can feel the blood pressure rising and your voice rises, and something just tripped your trigger. How many know what I'm talking about? Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. You know what happened? It's touched on something that was deep there already that you hadn't dealt with. Something from your past. Sometimes if a spouse can say something, if they say it a certain way, it kind of sounds like mom or dad, something we didn't like the way mom and, you know, anybody know what I'm talking about? You're like, whoa, don't even go there. Whoa, back up, back up, Jack. Don't even start that. Uh-uh, no, not no, no, no. And then all of a sudden it raises a whole different level because we've not addressed the situation that is deep-seated in us. Every behavior is based on a belief. Something from the past triggers it. And so what we got to say is, why did I get ticked off? Why did I go from a good, healthy argument, discussion, to off the charts, bad deal? Let's go back to the root of it, see? What's there that triggered that? What, what belief? What, 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 you know, we always say, I want to I change my behavior. We look at kids that are misbehaving, and we want to change their behavior. Well, you quit acting like that. What we got to do is get to the bottom of the belief of why are they acting that way? Most of the time, it's because of lack of discipline, healthy discipline. Parenting class is going on right now. It's outstanding. I encourage you to come Wednesday nights. A lot of the problems we have with kids today is because kids aren't disciplined anymore. You know, listen, I'm, I'm telling you, the Bible gives us principles how to discipline kids. You can say, well, I don't agree with that. We've learned all this. There's nothing we've learned in modern times that will, that will supersede what the Word of God teaches. God's Word works because He created us, and He knows what we need to do in order to be godly parents, godly husbands, godly wives, godly people. And if we will follow the principles of the Word of God, we will raise up a generation of young people that know God. But we got to do it God's way. We've got to change. Another foundation is anytime I sin, at that moment, I'm believing a lie. Proverbs 14, 12 says there's a path before each person that seems right, but in the end, it is death. We believe a lie and we sin. This is true especially of addictions. You ever met anybody with an addiction? Maybe you look in the mirror and say, yep, right here. People always justify their addictions. Well, I'm doing this, at least I'm not doing that. Well, why are you doing that? Oh, I'm just doing it because it makes me feel better. I'm just doing it because it's a nervous habit. It's hurting you. It's hurting you. Do you understand? Oh, you know, it may hurt other people, but it's not hurting me. I don't do it that much. Have you ever seen people that they're doing something that's hurting their body and then they get a bad report from the doctor and they quit doing it for five minutes? Come on now. And then they go back to doing it again and you're like, or or God heals them and they they, they go back doing it again. You're like, why are you doing that? Oh, it's okay. Are you crazy? Well, what happens is they're not crazy, but it's we lie to ourselves. We tell ourselves things are okay when they're not okay. We tell ourselves it's no big deal. We tell ourselves it's not hurting us. But the reality is there are things in this life, addictions, and it's all kinds of addictions. And before you point at someone else's addiction, time out. Look at your own. How we eat, whether we exercise is an addiction. We always want to point to people that do things that we think are so bad. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with people that do. That's how we always want to focus on. But what, what, you know, there's all kinds of things in our life that are addictions that we need to break, that we say, oh, we're okay, it's not going to affect us, we can get beyond this. Or, you know, I'm not like them, and we lie to ourselves. Every, every time I sin, I'm believing in self-defeating behavior that continues on and the Bible says it comes from the inside. We, a lot of people say, well, if they wouldn't put that stuff on TV, then I wouldn't have these problems. 
If she wouldn't have came at me like that, it wouldn't have happened. No, no, the problem is not what you're seeing. The problem is what's inside. The Bible says that in James chapter 1. James 1, 14 through 15 talks about that we're tempted. Why? Because of something inside of us. If you're lusting after someone, you know, yeah, I understand we live in a society today where people could put on some more clothes and that would be helpful. I get that, all right? But if there's a problem with lust, the problem is not here. The problem is you continue to look. The problem is there's an issue right here and here. And whatever that situation is. And so we got to change our thinking. We'll change our life. The enemy knows how to bait us. Does he not? He knows how to put the bait out there. Uh, how, many, how, many fish, how many fishermen or fisherwomen we got, fisher people we got here? Anybody? Raise your hand. So we used to go fishing all the time as a kid. My dad was a phenomenal fisherman. He, he should have he entered into contests. He knew how to fish. I'm not just saying it because of my dad. I, I loved going fishing with him, but I hated going fishing with him because he always caught stuff, and I didn't. But he always knew what bait to use. And you know, if you're fishing for catfish, use a certain bait. If you're fishing for bass, use a certain bait or crappie or whatever it is that you're fishing for, use different bait. But even like the thing that amazed me was when he would fish for bass, my dad would catch these huge bass. And you know, every year the bait would change, which was the one that they were most attracted to. I'm like, how do you know that? Do you pray? Is God telling you something? Because my dad would go out there and he would know, you know, this year it's the, it's the spotted ones. This year it's the shiny ones. This year it's the, you know, the striped ones. And I'm like, how do you know that? And he used to drive me nuts. Satan knows what kind of bait it takes to get you and me. What works for you doesn't work for me, but what works for me doesn't work for you. But he knows and so we've got to identify exactly what's going on and realize that anytime we step into sin, at that moment, I'm believing a lie. And because I believe the lie, I step into sin. If I would take captive that thought, make it obedient to Christ, then I wouldn't fall into sin. I wouldn't take the bait. Most fish will not get a hold of a hook without bait on it. Got to really be hungry to go after that one or dumb. Okay? Okay? But at the same time, loved ones, there's times that we know. We see the bait, but we know behind the bait's a hook. But we keep nibbling. And here's what we say. I'm not going to give in. I'm just going to get a little closer. I'm just going to enjoy this for just a moment and get a little closer. I'm strong enough to handle this. Most people aren't. They're not as strong as me, but I can handle this. And we get a little closer. Next thing you know, we fall. Why? Because we believe the lie. Change your thinking, change your life. Last week, I challenged us to think about what you think about. This week, I'm challenging you to be intentional about what you think about. I'm going to tell you two ways. I think we'll just get to two of these today. The first one is meditate. Most of us had a bad idea of meditation, like, like this here, right? Hum. Actually. Hum. Right? Most of us have that view of meditation. But yet the word meditation is used throughout the scriptures. Meditation is God's idea of how we are able to focus on what we need to focus on. Now, like I said, there are bad things in meditation. Uh, there are some that are, that are cultish. There are some that are worldly. There are some that will help you. But the meditation that's going to help you the most is when we meditate God's way. And so I'm going to take a few minutes this morning to talk about how to meditate the proper way. And some of you already freaked out. Oh my gosh, he's talking about meditation. I gotta get out of the church. This is a biblical term. If you'll take a time out and change your mindset and look at what the word of God says, you'll realize that the right way to meditate, if you do it the right way, that you'll grow, change your thinking, change your life. You know, we think of Eastern meditation, it empties the mind, but Christian meditation fills the mind. Eastern meditation is a detachment Christian meditation is an, it, 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 I'm sorry, Eastern meditation is a detachment. Christian meditation is an attachment to God. Eastern meditation is passive. Christian meditation is aggressive. Eastern meditation can often be worldly or demonic, but Christian meditation is Holy Spirit filled. Here's something that hit me as I was, as I was meditating on meditating. My meditation, not my situation, determines my destination. My meditation, what I think on, not my situation, determines my destination. Whatever you think on, that's what it's going to be. 
In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, God speaks to this as he raises up a new leader. And he said, Moses is dead, Joshua. 39 years, you watched him. You, you know what to do in a sense. But he said, let me tell you what else you need to do. Be strong and courageous. He tells him that over and over again. And then he says, verse 8, the book of the law, my word, shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do all that is written in it. And then you will make your way prosperous and successful. What you think about, your strongest thought will lead your life in that direction. What are you thinking about? What do you meditate on? A lot of people don't meditate at all. We run boom, 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 boom. One thing to this, to that, to the other. We never stop and think. We never stop and meditate. But what's in us is what leads us. What is in the, the predominant thought in us leads us to where we go. Well, what I want to encourage you to do is meditate on the Word of God. Meditate. Psalm 1-3. I love this as well. There's another passage, and you can look at this. Psalm 1-3 talks about what happens. You know, we can either meditate on the things of the world or the things of God. But Psalm 1-3 says, actually, let's read verse uh, 2. But he who delights in the law of the Lord... And in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also does not wither. And whatever he does will prosper. How many want to live that kind of that life? You meditate on the word of God. You meditate on what God says. Let me give you a couple other scriptures. Philippians 4, 8, we just read, says, think on these things or meditate on these things. If we go to Matthew 4, 4, uh, Jesus said when fighting the devil, by the way, you need to learn how to talk to the devil. And you say, well, I don't, we're not supposed to talk to the devil. Jesus talked to the devil. When the devil talked to the devil, how many have the devil talks to you? Anybody have the devil talk to you? So we just say what God says to the devil. The devil comes to Jesus. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We've got to meditate on what? On the words that proceed out of the mouth of God. Psalm 119, 147 says, I rise early to cry out for help. I put hope in your word. One translation says, I, I start the day with hope. You know there are over 7,000 promises in the word of God? Do, do you know that? So what am I going to meditate on? Am I going to meditate on what could go wrong? Am I going to meditate on the worst thing that happened? Or am I going to meditate on what God says? Come on, amen? And then Psalm 119, 148 says, My eyes are awake in the night watches to meditate on your word. Psalm 16, 7 says, The counsel of the Lord, his word gives me help in the night seasons. Morning, daytime, night. What do I need to meditate on? I need to meditate on what God says. You understand how that would change your life? You talk about changing the trajectory of your life. If in the morning we woke up and the first thing we did was, many of you are, uh, have joined me on a, a Bible challenge uh, on the U version. If you're not, you can join us. You can join our group. And we've still got some room for a few more. But reading the Bible every day, and there's all kinds of plans that are on there. But every morning, first thing it, it is rolling over. And a lot of people roll over and grab their phone and check Facebook or social media or or, or, you know, whatever's going on, the latest scores. But what if, we, what if we started every single morning and we rolled over and the first thing we did was we, we cried out to God and prayed to Him, but we also looked at the Word of God and we began to meditate on what God says. It'll change your attitude. It'll change your, it'll change your whole life. And then we go to another scripture uh, when Psalm 119, 95, when the wicked wait to destroy me, I keep my mind on your testimonies, on your Word. Uh, one of my favorite passages is Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. You will keep him in perfect peace who has his mind stayed on thee. His mind stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. I'm telling you, that's got me through a lot of stuff. When an enemy comes in hard, I'm like, God, I don't understand what's going on here. I'm not denying what's taking place. But, Lord, I trust in you. My mind is on you. I know, God, what you said. I know you said this is what you're going to do. And I believe you, God. And I'm standing on your word that, that no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. That I'm more than a conqueror. That greater is he that's in me that's in the world. That I'm going to see you move powerfully, God. I'm standing on that. And I meditate on that. And I speak the word of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, God, be pleasing to you. So how do, we, how do we meditate? Well, we, 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 what do we do when we meditate? We, we speak what God says. We meditate on how to. The second thing we do is not only meditation, and this is the last one we'll get to today, is reframe. Reframe what's going on. You better play baseball. A good catcher. Molina's a good catcher. I hate to admit it, but he's one of the best. Our son Jonathan caught. I tried my whole coaching career to talk him out of catching because of what it does to your knees now it shortens your career but he loved to catch because you're in on every play 
But have you ever noticed when a catcher, if you've got a good catcher, that a good catcher, if you've got a bad catcher, they'll catch a ball here and it'll end up here and the umpire will say ball. If you've got a good catcher, the ball will be here, but it'll end up here and, and the umpire will say strike. Because it's how you frame it. And so, I, you know, as I learned and Jonathan got into it, like, frame it. Frame that ball. Make that umpire think that's the best pitch that ever happened. You bring it right in. And if you get good at catching, man, you can pull that ball right in. And the hand's quicker than the eye, and you can make ball strikes. Come on, somebody. And if you're bad, you can make strikes balls. How do you frame something? See, we look at it and immediately look at the worst. But what if we reframe the situation? What if we reframe it? You say, well, Larry, how do you... How do you reframe? How do you change the call? Well, uh, Philippians 1, I love Philippians 1, uh, 12 and 13. He says, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happen to me really suck. And I'm going to quit the ministry, and I'm going to quit going to connection groups. I'm going to quit praying. I'm going to quit reading because I'm in prison, and this is horrible. Is that what Paul said? Is that what happened? Yes, he was in prison. But notice what he said. Brethren, the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. (laughs) We're quick on woe is me. My God, look how bad it is. Paul said, you know what? (laughs) This is a good thing. This has actually turned out well. Better than if I planned it myself. Me being locked up, beaten, put in prison, life-threatened has turned out to advance. What, the, what this has had, I would have never been able to advance the gospel as well as, as this that's happened. So he reframes it. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Paul reframed it. See, he was chained to a prison guard. He could have said, man, I got no freedom. I'm chained to this prison guard. I can't do anything. But Paul reframed it and said, every shift, a prison guard is chained to me. So for eight hours, I can tell him about Jesus. For eight hours, I can speak into his life. And then at the end of eight hours or the end of the shift, I get another one and I get to do it all over again. And then I get another one. And I'm never, I'm never shut up from ministering the gospel. I'm getting one-on-one time with some of the most powerful people. He reframed it. How do you reframe Three ways you reframe it. Number one, thanksgiving. Give thanks. Have you ever thought about Philippians says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. That's, like I said, that's a powerful statement. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. Have you ever given thanks for what didn't happen? Have you ever done that? I've been learning to do that more and more with my life. I'm not trying to think of bad things that could happen, but I'm, I'm, you know, you're smart enough to realize this could have went a whole different way. And so thank you, God, that it didn't happen. Thank you, God, that it worked out this way. Thank you, God, that you did this. I look at my life and I say, man, you know, with everything that happened, it could have been this. But thank you, God, that didn't happen. Thank you, God, you kept that from happening. Thank you, God, even when I told you I wanted that to happen, you said no. And I thought you were wrong, but I was. Thank you, God. Come on. And begin to thank him for what hasn't happened and thank him for what he has done. That totally changes the frame. The second thing is we got to learn to pre-frame. Pre-frame. Romans 4, 17 says this is what Scripture uh, means when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings back the dead to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Pre-frame it. Do you understand that we do pre-frame things? We often pre-frame it in a negative manner instead of a positive manner. We wake up. Remember I told you the post? Wow, 2020 already sucks. Well, you done pre-framed the whole year. Guess what? Unless we change the frame, it's going to be a bad year. So when you get up in the morning, do you, how do you frame it? How do you pre-frame the day? Do you wake up and say, oh, you don't have to be a morning person. You say, Larry, I'm not a morning person. That's fine. I get that. But if we get up and we say, you know what? This is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Man, God, you gave me another. I'm breathing. Hallelujah. I'm alive. Right? Amen. I've got another day to do something, God. I've got another day of destiny, another day to do something for you. And maybe you're facing something difficult that day, and you say, you know what, God? You woke me up today, so you're give me the strength to face this and be victorious. Already, I give you thanks for what you're going to do before it ever happens. So there's thanksgiving. There's pre-framing. Start your day with positive instead of a negative approach. Try it. It'll change your life. Start speaking it. The third thing is look for the goodness of God daily. It's easy to point out the negative stuff. 
Oh, God, this went horrible. Oh, Lord, this is terrible. And how, many, how many it's easy to point out the things that go wrong? Is it not? Let I me mean, just be honest, right? But how many times do we stop and look at the goodness of God? I challenge people in journaling to write down what I call an I spy from the Lord. Where did you see the hand of God at work in your life today? Oh, man, look what God did over here. Oh, and some of them will be like really small things, like, right? But how many of those small things add up to big things? But as you begin to identify the small things, then you begin to see more, and you're like, wow, God, that was really significant. You really, you really did a, a mighty work there. I see the goodness of God. I love what David said. David going through one of the most difficult times of his life. He said, I'm confident, Psalm 27, 13, and 14, yet I'm confident that I will see the Lord's goodness while I'm still here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. And yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Many people are prisoners of their own thoughts or things that are untrue, and then you live them out and make them true. So what are we going to do? Don't just think about what you think about. Be intentional what you think about. We've laid down foundations of, of what happens. So how do we change it? Well, two very simple principles here. We meditate. Meditate on what? You know, my watch, uh, my watch, you know, it's a smart watch. It tells me, like, to stand every hour. I'll be driving down the road, and it tells me to stand. I'm like, I can't, I can't stand right now. I'm driving. So I try to move my feet. Sometimes I can fool it, right? But it also tells me to breathe. It'll say, breathe. And I'll be like, I am. If I wasn't, I'd be dead. But meditate. All of a sudden, I was saying, you know, just take a deep breath. So, so Wednesday night, I was, Laura's in here teaching and, and with Rochelle. And so I'm, I'm patrol in the hallway for all the classes. So I got to be patrol. They gave me a radio, made me feel real important and, you know, all that. So I had this kid that was in class in the, toddler, in, the, in the nursery. And he was screaming. And he was under the table. So I had to go in and use my negotiating skills to get him out from under the table. And get him to stop screaming. And so I had to speak into his life. You know, I had to, I had to, I had to speak into his life and say, you know what? You know, don't, no, 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 don't, you know, don't do that. Take a breath, take a breath. I'm like, so I sit down with him on the floor and I said, hey, hey, come here, come here. Take a breath. Yeah. Isn't that better? And he's like, I'm trying, I'm trying. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you tell somebody to stop crying. I'm trying, I'm trying. I said, take a breath. I said, listen, your mom gets out at 8 o'clock. 45 minutes, you're, you're going to make it. I said, but look at this. We reframed it. I said, look at this classroom. Do you see all these toys? You get to play with these toys until she comes. This is great. He gets out from underneath the table. He's all happy. He's fine. But I had to do it like seven times. <laughs> so my point is this. It may take more than once. It may take more than once to get our meditation where it needs to be. You ought to see him when mom came. He was so happy. It may take more than once to reframe it, to preframe it, right? To think on what you need to think on. I don't know what you're going through right now. I'm not dismissing what you're going through. I understand what it is to go through difficult thoughts. I understand what it is to go through difficult seasons. I understand what it is to go through hard times where you don't see hope. But I'm telling you, if we'll do what God says in 2020, it'll be the best year yet. If we will change our thinking, we will literally change our life. Meditate on what God says. Morning, during the day, in the evening, in the night season, meditate on it and reframe things. Say what God says about it and don't settle until it becomes what God says. Amen. I want to ask you to stand to your feet this morning. You may be here today and say, you know, Larry, that all sounds good, but I've never given my heart to Jesus. I don't I don't know, you know, I don't know how to do that. Well, outside of Christ, you, there's some things you can do in the natural, but outside of Christ, you can't really do it because it's in Christ. That's where it all changes. We become a new creation. See, we're all mentally ill outside of Christ, right? Come on, somebody, amen? But he renews our mind. We get born again. It changes, and we begin to grow and renew our mind on a regular basis. And so God wants to renew your mind today. God wants to bless you. God, he wants to give you peace that passes understanding. He wants to give you joy that's... Uh, impossible for you to even know how to say how do I have joy in this situation but yet you do and so with every head bowed and every eye closed let's just take a moment and focus on the Lord if you're here this morning you say Larry I want to give my life to Jesus I want to know peace I want to know joy I want to be able to do what you're saying I want to be able to meditate on the good things I want to be able to change my thinking and change my life if that's you will you raise your hand 
And I want to pray with you right now. If that's you, just lift your hand up over this place. I see hands going up. Some more hands. Anybody else? I mean, literally, hands all different places of the church. Anybody raise your hand if that's you. Join those that's raised their hand. This is the beginning right here. Amen? Now, I want you to pray with me. Those that raise your hand, everybody else join in as well. And I'm going to say it, but you say it from your heart and through your mind. In other words, we're going to change our thinking. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and change my thinking. I give you my life. Forgive me of my sins. Baptize me in the Holy Spirit and the fire of God. I want you to be number one from this moment on. I give you my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Amen. Now I'm going to ask our prayer team to come, if you would, and spread it throughout the, uh, the front here at the altar. And if you made that decision, first of all, we rejoice with you. Amen. Can we rejoice? If you made it for the first time or the hundredth time, we rejoice with you. But if you made it for the first time or second or third and you've never been baptized in water, we encourage you to take that next step. We have a Bible for you. We have some material for you. We want to help you grow in Christ. Maybe you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you want prayer for more of God in your life. We want you to receive that as well so you can be all that God called you to be. So I want to encourage you to come. Anyone up here can pray with you. They can get you the materials. And then also we're going to spread communion across the altar here. And we're going to give you an opportunity to come partake of the Lord's Supper. I always want to be reminded that this is what it's about. It's the juice and the bread that represents his body bruised and beaten for us. So every time we take this, don't take it lightly. Every time you take this, if you're a born-again baptized believer, you're reminded as the bread underneath the juice that his body was bruised and beaten for us. The juice represents his blood that was shed. And because, of the, because, he, because he gave his life, we can have forgiveness of sins. That's, pretty, that's amazing. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed my sins from me, if I'll come to Christ. And so I want to encourage you to come partake of the Lord's Supper. If you need prayer for any reason, they'll pray with you. They'll believe with you. Maybe you just want to come to the altar and say, you know, Larry, I just want to come to the altar, kneel down, and spend some time with the Lord. You, you come and spend as much time as you want with the Lord. And let God do a work in you. I promise you this, in 2020, if you'll change your thinking, you'll change your life. Amen. Father, I pray you bless each one. God, if we come to a point of decision, we come to a point of... Of, of, of dedicating ourselves to you or rededicating ourselves to you. We come to a point of changing our mindset, our thinking. Uh, God, it's amazing what happens when we change our mindset, how we can go from defeat to victory in a heartbeat, how we can go from turmoil to peace, how we can go from depression to joy, how, God, you're able to do a work in us. And so I pray right now that as we come, as we partake of the bread and the juice, as we remember the sacrifice, as we remember the love, as we remember, it's by you, your sacrifice, that we're saved, healed, and set free. I pray that today we would leave here changed, totally transformed by the renewing of our minds as we go in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please come receive, come and pray. Holy out of darkness, And no other voice will define me Cause I belong to you I belong to you Oh, you call me out of darkness Silence
Cause I belong